Thursday Night Talk. This is a show where we discuss the week in humble to the local issues with the local personalities. I'm Talby Freed and I'll be your local host for the next hour. We don't often think of the county jail as a place to get an education. Through a partnership with College of the Redwoods, that is exactly what is happening. What type of offerings are available for people serving their time? And do these educational offerings actually help to break the cycle of recidivism and assist with the reintegration of these individuals into the community? What other services are aimed at aiding a successful transition from incarceration to society? That's right, we're talking about jail systems, rehabilitation programs, and specifically educational programs available to those who are incarcerated tonight. Joining us to discuss these topics are Jonathan Milo, Student Development Advisor for College of the Redwoods Adult and Community Education Program, Tony Wallens. Sato is the program director for Project Rebound at Cal Poly Humboldt, also the co-founder of Project Rebound, at least a chapter within Humboldt. And we have Wendy Butler, associate faculty from the College of the Redwoods, who is currently teaching in the Humboldt County Jail and happens to be the host of Art Attitude, which you can hear right here on KZZH 96.7 FM. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Nice to be here. So I... I'd like to start off by uh, giving everyone an opportunity to just say what it is they do, how, what are your programs? Uh, Let's, let's start off with Jonathan, uh, because I'm, I, I knew that there were programs available, though I know that out, Humboldt County has, has resources that aren't available in other areas. I, I will say that much, or it feels like that. I know that in other states, there are inmates aren't even allowed books in, in some places. And then there's places and countries which allow a complete rehabilitation program from the get-go. And so it's, uh, I'm, I'm curious because I know very little about what actually happens when somebody is incarcerated. Uh, so so Jonathan, let's, let's start off with, with you. Okay, yeah, thanks, Calvi. I appreciate that. Um, so we offer non-credit classes in the Humboldt County Correctional Facility um, that run different lengths of time, but usually semester length. However, non-credit classes are slightly different from regular class programming in that you can um, start a class mid-semester. Uh, the instructor works to generally catch you up on the material that you've missed and um, you don't necessarily have to stay till the end either, which works pretty well in the county jail situation where uh, you have a fairly transient population, you know, folks that are waiting for sentencing or they're, they're moving around from dorm to dorm, uh, things like that, where you know, the future is sort of unwritten at that point. Um, we offer an array of these classes. Um, they've, they've run the gamut from everything from English as a second language for multilingual students to uh, anger management in the workplace classes. Um, Wendy will be able to tell you quite a bit more about the classes that she's taught, which um, have been quite a few as well. But we also have computers classes, uh, addiction studies classes. Um, And you mentioned the ways in which Humboldt County is potentially unique in these offerings. While many county jails have similar offerings, um, and and indeed some some go quite a bit further, um, we are fortunate enough to be able to offer a a credit class uh, for the first time this semester, and that we have uh, an intro to addiction studies class that is a four credit class um, so it connects students with the rest of that certificate uh, after their their released, um, and that's a, that's not a very common thing. I think at this point it's like maybe uh, five or six county jails throughout the state that that have credit classes in them right now, from from my understanding. Um, so that that's one way in which our program is unique. We also have classes that are both 
in person and um, correspondence modality so that they can be everywhere uh, because folks in, in cell units, for example, can't can't take classes that are offered uh, to the larger population. So um, we like to think that we're we're doing our best to uh, serve the interests of these students in this particular modality. Yeah, and Wendy, what what is an arts program like within the county jail? Well, well um, to uh, be clear about that, I'm not teaching arts at the jail. Um, I teach, uh, among the number of classes that I teach, those include Read 260, which is reading comprehension, writing, critical thinking, and we can discuss that more later if we have time. I also teach the high set class. Uh, the the uh, read 260 is in person. The high set is correspondence. And again, we can talk more about correspondence education later. But the high set is for um, students who are working toward getting their high school uh, equivalency certification. But the majority of the students who take the high set uh, have their high school diplomas, um, but they want a refresher, basically, multiple subjects, science, social studies, uh, language arts, reading and writing, math. Notice how I say math last, um, because math is not my highest uh, uh, Specialty, <laughs> but um, I've also taught anger management. I've taught living well on on fixed income. I've taught uh, I've taught uh, uh, communication skills, uh, different sorts of communication related classes. I've taught uh, college and career foundations, uh, as have others of our instructors as well. So uh, our, our programs at the Humboldt County Correctional Facility are, uh, I think that what they have in common is um, a lot of reading, thinking, and writing, but a lot of them are also beneficial for students who are working toward uh, go getting back into the workforce. And so it gives them a wide variety of different subjects of interest and refreshers and perhaps subjects that they are learning about for the first time. So thank you. No, yeah. I just want to throw we actually do have an art class as well too. So right, yeah, yeah, we do. Wendy doesn't teach it, but we do, we do have an art class communication through adapted art as well. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Awesome, and Tony, uh, what is Project Rebound? Yeah. Um, so Project Rebound is a student wrap around support program for former incarcerated students. Um, we're a special, unique program. Uh, I'm formerly incarcerated myself. Um, and so it's the model is led by a peer-to-peer -peer program, right? Um delivered services from formerly incarcerated who have experienced it, who are in the professional and educational realm um, for the formerly incarcerated. Uh, and so Project Rebound is actually about a 56-year-old program started at SF State back in 1967 um, by a man named John Irwin, who spent time in prison in the 50s. Uh, and he took his first correspondence class while in uh, Soledad State Prison in 1956. Um, <clears throat> and when he got out, um, that was the first time that he had an educational opportunity. And so what he did, he was, he went back to school, he got his doctorate degree, started teaching at SF State, and he had students um, who were coming up to him with similar experiences. And so uh, he started Project Rebound in a broom closet uh, in the sociology department. And the program, although successful, um, was housed at SF State. It didn't really get any funding. Uh, it was purely led by him uh, in the sociology department. And uh, it kind of just stayed there for the last you know, couple of decades. 
Uh, and then with laws changing, the whole shift on punishment, rehabilitation, education, recidivism rates, California during 2012, 2013 was, uh, we're about like 160% over capacity. The federal government was coming in saying, you know, we're going to step in if, um, you know, California, if you don't like fix your, your overcapacity problem. I mean, you had day rooms with bunks on top of bunks on top of bunks. You had three people to a cell uh, and a lot of medical issues going on. Uh, and so there was this shift and this change. Uh, we had realignment and certain policy changes going down. And so in 2015, 2016, uh, a one-time grant came for a pilot program for nine campuses uh, in the CSU to have their own project rebound. Uh, it was so successful. The next year, the grant came back, and then we started expanding more and more. Uh, and so now we're at, um, I want to say, 15 campuses uh, statewide. Uh, and so we really just... Um, we just work within the community, within different facilities, um, making sure that folks with incarceration experience uh, or who've been through the criminal justice system know that they belong in higher ed, that they deserve a seat in the classroom, that this place is just uh, enough or, you know, for them as much as anyone else. Uh, and so we kind of eradicate those barriers. Uh, if you have a felony conviction, you have about 40,000 different stipulations tied to you that blockade your mobility, success, et cetera. Uh, and so what we do is, um, you know, we don't just give support, but we also really help navigate those structural barriers um, so students can thrive and succeed in higher education. So I wanted to ask this next question because you had mentioned, uh, I mean, I wanted to ask it before you mentioned it, but punishment versus rehabilitation. And are there certain crimes that bar people from entering these programs? Is there like, and, and I say this because I, I mean, my own beliefs are, are, are one thing though. There's, there's studies that have been done that, you know, if you teach a psychopath how to communicate well, they just become more of a psychopath. And, you know, there is that, there are people out there who believe that like, oh, you should be punished in jail. And then there's people who believe that, oh, you should obviously rehabilitate from the beginning. So are there certain types of like violent crimes that would not allow people to be in, a, in an educational space or? I think the myth surrounding incarceration is that people use extremes for the overall cross the board. Um, and that's just not the case. I mean, uh, people who serve long sentences for what the state deems a violent crime actually are the least likely to recidivate, though we give harsher and stricter um, ma uh, mandatory sentences. So you have someone who has done decades in prison for right, a violent crime. Um, when they get out, they're least likely to recidivate. Um, but the laws that are in place bar them from actually paroling uh, or re-entering society. I could go on about this, but I'll let other people. Yeah, I, I'll speak to this too, um, just because I'm I'm still somewhat new to, to working with incarcerated students. And so I, I, you know, I'm still somewhat fresh from this point of view too, because I remember thinking initially, you know, wow, I, I don't really know if, if this is the place for me. I, I don't know if I'll if I'll be able to work with these students the way that I've worked with students in the past. I have a background as an instructor. So um, I'm, you know, working with them in an advisory capacity now and helping them sign up for classes and such. And I, I think that it's 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 certainly cliche, but it's absolutely true where these students will will always surprise you with their zest for education and their um, willingness to, to seek out, you know, what opportunities are available to them um, and, and sort of belie, I think, our, our expectations, especially, you know, maybe like systemic expectations that we might have of them. Um, and then talking to the public about these classes quite a bit, I, I hear, you know, these things, well, like, how can you work with like so-and-so or somebody who's committed this particular crime, you know, um, 
it, it was definitely maybe a moment that gave me a little bit of pause when I, you know, you're working in like a protective custody situation and, and you know, you realize that maybe certain people that you're working with have, have done things that, that you, especially like maybe as a parent are a little bit afraid of, but then, you know, you realize that in this situation, these people are, are in a, in a rehabilitation scenario and you're offering these classes and why would you limit the classes that you offer to people who've done x but not people who have done y i mean all, all you're doing at that point is saying you were unworthy of any support ever for the rest of your life and what does that do to somebody's impression of themselves right i mean how are they ever going to get to a point where they feel like they have any self-worth if, if that just continues to perpetuate itself so i'm you know very happy to be able to work with students of any kind that are interested in the classes. I would say that that's probably the one limitation is like, of course, it's got to be of their own volition, right? I mean, like we're not banging down doors to, to say like, you know, take classes. Um, but, you know, always when students are interested in taking classes, they're interested in taking classes, period. They're not there to, to do anything else. They're, they're there to engage with what we're able to offer them and, and to make the best of it. And I've seen that Time and time again, you know, I, I can say that I've been pretty fortunate to see that sort of bridging the gap as they as they're released too, and then we work outside, um, and their perseverance doesn't really wane. If anything, sometimes it, it takes off. So that's that's always been something that I've I really appreciated seeing. So, um, in answer to your question, overall, I think that there are there are no particular crimes that aren't that aren't worthy of education. I don't know if Wendy wants to speak to that. This, uh, there are two things. Uh, one, there are, and I know Johnny uh, mentioned this earlier, there are students who for a variety of reasons are not able to attend our in-person classes at the correctional facility. So they are attending our correspondence classes. Uh, and I don't, would you like me to speak to how that works, correspondence, when I say course, you know, I'm not gonna assume you know what that is. So basically the way a correspondence class works is that instructors prepare several assignments weekly and we put them together in a packet and then we deliver it to the adult and community education office, and then they deliver that packet to our uh, programs coordinator at the jail. And then the students receive those packets and students um, have a, you know close to a week to finish those assignments. And then, you know, speaking for myself, what I do is when I pick up the weekly packet, I look at the students' responses to the different assignments and we correspond that way. In other words, I'll write questions and comments and corrections and then return the homework submissions to the students. And so we have a back and forth that way. That is how that type of education works. And that was our only, for more than a year during COVID, uh, during the height of the, the shutdown in 2020, 2021, that was how we educated our students. And, um, and for a lot of students, communicating that way might be their best way or in some, in some instances, really almost the only way they can fully feel comfortable to communicate in an educational setting is to do it through correspondence education. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to say was about, and Johnny and I were discussing this um, before this interview, about confidence levels. Students in this context, in this academic context, particularly, I've noticed this for years doing this uh, in our in-person classes, they just thrive. I think overall they thrive. In the context of the classroom, uh, they feel uh, there's a freedom 
um, to be, I'm not going to say someone else because they're, they are who they are, but parts they're discovering. And they've said this to me and they, they've said this to us. They're discovering parts of themselves that you, you need to take your break. We do, but you can finish your sentence. Oh, okay. <laughs> They're just discovering parts of themselves that they didn't otherwise know existed, and they just want to continue to develop those, you know, precious parts of themselves. And we can discuss that more later. Okay, sounds good. And yes, it is time for the first break of the day. You're listening to Thursday Night Talk. <laughs> Welcome back to Thursday Night Talk. I'm your local host, Talvi Freed. I am here with Jonathan Maiulo, Student Development Advisor for College of the Redwoods, Adult and Community Education Program, Tony Wallen Sato, Program Director and Co-Founder of Project Rebound at Cal Poly Humble, and Wendy Butler, Associate Faculty from College of the Redwoods, who also happens to be a current teacher at the Humboldt County Jail. And we are discussing kind of what, I guess, rehabilitation programs for those who are incarcerated because it sounds like there's a multitude of things happening here and not just any one way for any one or for any in group uh it, it it does sound like this is available to everybody which is the, the high set class which would help people get their HED or college preparedness uh project rebound which helps people get into the collegiate programs. Uh, though I, I wanted to to now kind of veer into, uh, Wendy, you had mentioned, you know, that education find, helps people find part of themselves. And and I want to go back to the, the or, there's a huge stigma uh, against people who have been incarcerated. Um, and, and for somebody to become incarcerated to to have to go through things and i and i have friends and i don't need to tell their stories but they grew up in situations where you know i i didn't know them then we lived different lives and i met them after incarceration um because my life has been lucky in that way uh though it was they they were not lucky with what they grew up with and one of my friends in particular did end up getting an education uh, and is doing very well for themselves. But they went into prison when they were uh, 18, 19, um, due to gang related things that happened. And so I kind of want to go into what these programs offer because because of that stigma, like some, and I just want to say that sometimes people don't know that there is aside to them that he can, can't even fit into society, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, so if anybody would like to take that over, what, what can people find within themselves that they haven't found? And how do these programs actually help people escape the lives that they lived? Because I think sometimes people who go to jail and prison literally are just repeating patterns either from generations or from those around them because they ended up in a tough spot or were born into one. Yeah, I think um, I think a lot of us who've been incarcerated have negative experiences with education prior hand or like you said, we have past traumas. I mean, 80% of people in the California state prison system have been through the foster care system. Like that's a really high percentage, 80%. You know, a third of the entire nation has a criminal conviction, right? So it's, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's, you know, like mass incarceration is, is, is called that for a reason. And I think that, you know, a lot of us have heavy trauma that we never either dealt with or didn't have the resources in order to, um, you know, face some type of healing or transformative um, practice. Um, 
you know, an education is scary. And I know for me, after my release, my last incarceration release, going back to school was really scary. Um, you know, I got a lot of tattoos. Um, They're very noticeable, walking on campus, not feeling like you belong. Um, but really education, um, just like with every anybody else going to campus, it is a place for you to find that identity, to find that confidence, to find that voice. Uh, and so, you know, programs like like ours um, and, you know, and CR being inside, um, you know, it really, you know, instead of saying inmates or prisoners, right, like students, people who are incarcerated, right, it gives us a human, human language, a, 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 a human-centered focus. Uh, and so when we refer to folks who are inside taking these classes as students, you tend to think yourself as a student, like I'm a student, um, right? Uh, and then when you get on campus, you no longer are, you know, my ID 3991456, right? I was identified as a number. I'm now a student, you know, now I'm a professional. Now I, I'm actually a professor now. Now I teach on campus, et cetera. But it's like those little shifts of identity changes that gives us one hope, inspiration, um, and that voice. Um, because like I said, a lot of us, you know, when I was 13, um, <clears throat> I was living in hotel rooms with my father, uh, who had a schizophrenic break and I had to turn in homework, uh, on like a, like a hotel notepad. And my teacher in my eighth grade year, uh, gave me a zero credit, told me to come to the classroom and said, why are you turning in paper on a hotel notepad? And I said, well, I ran out of paper. Um, and instead of him asking me, why are you living in hotel rooms? Why are you don't have paper? Uh, he automatically gave me a zero uh, and, you know, embarrassed me in front of the whole class. And so, you know, those kind of situations really are impressionable. I got arrested that first year, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, a lot of us, like I said, have like these negative experiences with with you know just education in general and not belonging and i think specifically these programs are so important you know wendy going in and treating these students like students and going into a classroom and johnny going in you know it's it's really humanizing a lot of times we don't feel like we've been humanized or we've been treated like humans uh and you know fact is we just want to um, you know, be happy and, and heal from our own traumas. Uh, so. One of the things that I, I've lamented in the past is as we worked on getting credit classes and such is that students would ask me, you know, what, what they could transfer, you know, from what they were learning, you know, if they, if they could use credits or otherwise, and, you know, you have to say these are non-credit classes, so they're not necessarily transferable, but of course you're, you're building up that, that ability to to sit through a class, um, you know, you're you're building up that ability to to do critical thinking about a subject. You're, you're building up that ability to see yourself as a student, as, as Tony mentioned. Um, and, and so that you know, while that's all things that are sort of added benefits, but really getting to the heart of it, it is that that sort of shift change and that that build of confidence. One story that that. Uh, strike me as being particularly representative of that is I, I work with students doing the high set test, which you mentioned probably is, is high school equivalency, um, which is one of the few things that that right now you can you can actually walk out of the jail with that you you didn't walk in with this that's beneficial, right? So like if you don't have high school equivalency, we can actually do that whole thing uh, in the jail. But you know, I've heard a lot of times students are saying like I, you know, I don't know if I'm gonna be any good at this and um, you know, I always tell them you have three opportunities per subject. So why not just give it a shot, especially because, you know, the, the funding is coming from somewhere else and outside sometimes you have to pay for it on your own. So it's really beneficial, right? Like here you have this moment to just take it. And um, once I was delivering the news to somebody that they had passed one of the tests and um, his friend came over and wanted to know, you know, what we were talking about. And, and, and his friend said, Oh, I'd love to try that, but you know, I've never passed anything in my life. I mean, imagine that sentiment. Like I've never passed anything in my life. 
I mean, that just shows like, you know, what your experience with the educational system has been, right? And like, and, and how you think of yourself interacting with it. And, and then his friend who had just gotten his results said, well, look, I did it. You can do it too. Why don't you give it a try? And then, and then he did it. And then he, and then he went on to finish all five tests and like watching that transformation of being like, I can't pass anything to like, look at now I've got high school equivalency. What am I going to do next? And you just watch people come up and just start to change their mentality and see like these options are for them too. And that's just such a beautiful thing to be a part of it. It's almost, you know, for, for people like Tony and Wendy and I, like it's, it's it's probably more gratifying than most work is, you know, just to, to be able to uh, be a part of somebody's journey like that. So we're constantly trying to find new ways that we can augment that, but just to see that shift is just magical. Wendy, did you want to add on to that one? Yeah, I was thinking. Uh... I was thinking about about that, uh, that I have had students who, um, a lot of times in my in-person classes, I when we are reading a story or a poem or some kind of informational text, I like to have us read it out loud and, um, you know, take turns, you know, reading different passages from it and then discuss it and i don't mandate anybody read aloud but i think that uh, i think that it additionally helps to understand what we're reading if we if we read it out loud and if we discuss and discuss and ask questions and i've had students uh you know coming in saying you know i i'm terrible at this i you know i can't i i don't know how to pronounce this or you don't, you don't want to read my writing. I can't spell. And, and it's like, I, I say to them, I say to them, um, it's, it's all right. Just do what you can. And if you can't answer this in complete sentences, that's okay. Um, just get those ideas out there, you know, speak to us, speak to me, or write in fragments or write in, you know, pieces of sentences, you know, those fragments are going to mean something. And I've had students just, just glow. I mean, I literally see the glowing um, and, and contrary to what, you know, you often hear about in terms of the culture Incarcerate and incarcerated culture. I have found more often than not, when we're in a classroom situation, the students not only are excited about participating, but they are respectful of one another and of me. In other words, I don't have to get up there and say, you have to do this, you have to be quiet, you know, all that. It's like they're like, yeah. And they're listening and they're asking one another questions and not, you, you know, I mean, fair questions, you know, um, respectful questions. And so they generally want to know. They want to know answers and they're like, huh. And so my hope, my hope always is that they'll take all of this that we engage in in the classroom and they'll take it back to the dorm with them. And then upon th their release, they'll take that out into the world, into their living and working environment. And just remember, you know, what is possible, the good things. So it seems like uh, the programs that people can leave with right now, because I read somewhere that you can, if you're incarcerated in I think Pelican Bay, you can leave with a bachelor's of arts from Humboldt or for Cal Poly Humboldt now. Well, that we're, we, yeah, that's something we've been working on the last three years. Um, and we will be offering a bachelor's in communications in spring of 2024. So next semester, um, we just got our um, 
<clears throat> we just got our applications in our 25 we have 27 applications for students uh we have about 30 student capacity. We're reviewing um, the applications now. Very excited about that opportunity. It'll be the first bachelor's program, in-person bachelor's program uh, on a level four yard in the state. Um, and yeah, I mean, the most brilliant, creative, intelligent, you know, um, people are are locked away in in in. America's prison system. Yeah, kudos to Tony for, for getting that going. Um, I also want to just throw out there at the bat, the, the value of that versus like say classes or an associate's degree, when you move up uh, in terms of education, you probably heard the idea that like education written in lowers recidivism rates. But when you, when you move up in terms of degrees too, it goes further and further down. To the point where I think right now, like if you if you earn a master's degree, there's like zero percent recidivism or something. Am I right about that, Tony? You probably have the numbers better than I do, but yeah, I'm yeah. I mean, a master's is, is essentially like you're almost in like the negatives. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, but you exit you exit with the bachelor's, you're you're almost in like the one percent of of you know recidivating. Um, so I know this is kind of um, a potential myth, but somebody was like, oh, you're talking about this today. Uh, I've heard of people getting their law degree while in there and defending themselves. Is that actually a thing that really happens? Because I know I've, we've all watched movies with that happening, but can you actually get a, a complete law degree and then represent yourself in court? You can pass the, you can, you can pass the bar exam. Okay, so in two weeks, we're actually having a speaker come to Cal Poly Humboldt. His name's Dr. Jamie Banal. Um, he's the executive director for Long Beach State Project Rebound. He passed the bar exam while he was in prison. And when he got out, he went to law school. He became an attorney. Um, he also got his PhD. He's kind of an overachiever. Um, but he, um, there's no, yeah, law school. Um, I mean, it, the momentum's getting there. Uh, also, amazing poet and creative reginald Dwayne betts anyone who doesn't know him please look him up he's amazing he um when he got he was sent to prison at 16 for eight years when he got out he went to yale from um and he got his law degree and now he's an attorney uh and so yeah there's more and more folks um yeah pursuing and in california uh, there's actually like a formerly incarcerated group to help folks get into law school and study for the bar exam. Um, you know, when you have, there's a, every, you know, most jails, every prison, you have a law library. So when you're waiting, you're studying your case or you're studying other cases. I know I did, I was in the law library. I, you know, don't know anything about law. And then, you know, all of a sudden I'm reading cases here and there and that, you know, and so, like I said before, I mean, most, you know, brilliant, creative, intelligent people inside. I mean, they're really studying these cases and they know law, you know, they really, they really do. I have a, a friend who helped folks get there, um, who is actually at Project Rebound in Sacramento, but he, he's pursuing his law degree now. And um, he was helping folks get their sentences lowered, um, you know, while he was inside, he, you know, so the momentum's there and the shift is changing for people to to get into those positions because who better to practice law than those who, you know, were on the other side of that, you know, and 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 create a healthy, positive impact in that field. Well, thank you for that one. Uh <laughs> I really wanted to know the answer to that because I was like, is that just in movies? No, apparently there's a whole group for previously incarcerated lawyers. And it's true. If I ever needed a lawyer for a criminal defense lawyer, I'd probably want one who knows how to both break the law and not get caught, though, preferably, but also one who can get themselves out of jail. That's <laughs> the thing, though, right? Like anybody can pass the bar. Isn't that, that you know, the way that it works? It's like you can, anybody can can take the bar. It's passing it. I mean, that's that's the phenomenal thing, right? It's not like, because that's with no formal access to education. 
so it was dangerous. I, I did wonder if, because I thought you couldn't practice law if you had a felony. Mm -mm. I mean, no. I mean, we could be on jury now. Like, that's that just shifted. Um, that was like, well, at least in California, that was like one of the last things that we were barred from, right? I mean, we got our voting rights back <clears throat> a couple of years ago, uh, and now um, we're able to serve on a, on a jury. So more and more stuff are kind of, you know, and then a couple of years ago, Project Rebound as a whole statewide entity banned the box in higher education, you know, asking if you're getting hired um, um, about felony convictions. Um, and so we do, a lot, you know, we do a lot of work in, in terms of, right, again, eradicating those barriers that a lot of us face um, when we're just trying to succeed. I feel like I've been asked that, you know, background checks and if you've had a felony or things on on job applications. I didn't realize that was banned now or um, cool. Though we will be right back after our second break right here on Thursday Night Talk. Welcome back to Thursday Night Talk. I'm here with Jonathan Maiulo, Tony Wallen Sato, and Wendy Butler. We are discussing kind of a, what happens with the incarcerated once they're incarcerated and what their options and programs are. And I wanted to ask for those who maybe, I mean, a free education is something people dream about. Like it's it's not something everybody gets, and not that it's necessarily a free education for those who are incarcerated, though the opportunity is there and funding is there. And if the funding is there, I'm very adamant, like take the funding um, because somebody set that money aside and it should be used for what it's intended for, which is to make sure that there isn't recidivism. So people um, don't go back into jail or prison, which I thought it was interesting that there is a very, very like a 1% rate of returning uh to to jail or prison if you have your um uh, bachelor's uh I, I wonder what the rate is for associates though i i wanted to ask because we have about 10 minutes and for nine minutes till the round robin are there any other programs available for people and what about people who have been incarcerated and maybe you haven't gone back to prison but are looking for help that, that want to be involved, that maybe these programs weren't around when they were in prison or jail, and now they're somewhere else, maybe not in prison or jail because they got good at avoiding that, but still want help. Is there like a, I've been in prison, kind of like people who've been in foster care can often, it doesn't matter how old they are, they can get funding to go back to school. Uh, so the funding thing, just real quick, you know, it, I mean, it's, if you're in the state of California, any any person, I mean, right, will get a free two year tuition coverage through grants. Um, so it's not, you know, funding educational opportunities for those who are incarcerated is not taking away any money, and it's not anything that's like added on that, you know, citizens who have been incarcerated aren't getting. Um, so you know. To get your college education in California, I mean, you go to community college, your first two years are free. Um, and then when you get into a four year, you still get grants, et cetera. It's the same, you know, the, with a little bit left over to pay. It's essentially the same for incarcerated, um, but also like kind of flip it, right? It costs about $80,000 a year to incarcerate someone. You incarcerate someone for 20 years, that's in the millions. You give them a bachelor's degree for a fraction of that in a couple of years. And now they're paying taxes, they're have a job, <clears throat> they're working in society, they're making a positive social impact. Um, you know, so, you know, these opportunities that are granted um, are again, just not, yeah, I think I think that's like a, a, 
I'm glad you brought it up because that's like an argument a lot of folks tend to have on the uh, when they're against these things, and it's the opportunity is still there for everybody um, on on both sides. Yeah, as far as opportunities go, as Tony mentioned, you've got the California Promise Grant, which uh, renders community college credits for free. Uh, on top of that, it's I mean, there's an income cap to it, right? But like most, uh, you qualify for it. Then you've got, um, you know, Pell Grant monies. Um, you, you've got, you know, Cal Grant. There's, there's a lot of ways to get extra funding uh, to start an education, higher education. Um, and then uh, something that I share with a lot of students that they're, they're not always aware of is that college isn't necessarily a bachelor's degree, you know, going on to graduate school, something, you know, that might seem a little more nebulous and daunting um, is that we have, especially at the community college level, a lot of shorter term certificate programs, which are great for connections to jobs, especially in the area. Um, for example, College of the Redwoods has programs in solar installation that are one semester long. We've got wiring, we've got um, certificates in welding, construction technologies, automotive repair, things of that nature. It, it, you're not going to have to be going to school for four years full time while you're trying to juggle a job and a family and all of that. Um, and that, you know, once you're in the classes, you're connecting with people who are working in the area too. So often it's in, in, in for a job. So, you know, that's, that's another opportunity that I, I don't think is often considered when we have this kind of higher education conversation. Everybody's picturing mortarboard hats and, and you know, like PhDs and that sort of thing, you know, as, as great as that is, like it's, it's not for everybody. I mean, again, I, I think of where I am now, I, I often thought about going back to school, but I'm in a situation when, you know, with kids, like I, I can't do it now. Like this is just simply not possible. So, you know, I like I like to remind students of of those possibilities too, especially those who are, who are you know, kind of have going back to what we were saying earlier, like one perception of what education is, and it doesn't so much involve them. It's like, hey, there are there are plenty of opportunities here, plenty of things that you might find that can fit you. Um, and then, you know. To, to connect the students and like provide those opportunities too. It's like, you know, I always welcome them to come to my office and we, you know, we meet and we talk about them and then we can do FAFSA together. Um, I know that, that Tony does this in, in his office as well, you know, connecting students with those financial aid opportunities, getting them signed up for classes. Um, you know, that can be a really crucial step because we've been working with them so much like while they're in the jail, we wanna make sure that we're continuing that you know, once the student is released and not suddenly they go, oh, okay, well, now that you're out, you know, you go figure it out on your own. You know, I mean, that can be really daunting. Going to the CR campus, it's like, where's your first stop? And the student welcome center is right there in front of you, but is that is that where you automatically go? You know, so it's it's nice to to have forged a relationship and then and then continue that relationship on. Like, okay, how can I help you from here now that you and I are already in contact with each other? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, strong advocate on on certificate programs, trade programs. I mean, CR's got, I mean, HVAC. I mean, there's a lot of good careers. And, and <clears throat> you know, we say from GED to PhD because we'll help along in between those, right, those lines. But we get a lot of students. I mean, we work, I, you know, we work with Johnny a lot. Um, <clears throat> you know, we'll get students who right need a high set or need their high school diploma or ged credits etc um and we'll still you know because we're formerly incarcerated and formerly incarcerated community members come to us and they say hey um i want to get into welding well let's let's connect you let's be that warm handoff because you're comfortable talking with us um instead of you know like johnny said it's daunting it can be daunting going to the cr campus etc and so, you know, when we we go to the diff various communities up uh, Jefferson Center, we go to Hoopa, we go to Del Norte, and we we share space. That way, we bring our services to community members, so that daunting factor isn't kind of, you know, a barrier. And so we we make that war hand up all the time. Like, hey, you don't want to come to Humboldt? That's totally fine. We're here to just make sure that whatever your educational path is, whether it be a trade or a certificate, um, 
the opportunities there and we will help guide you. So I want to go back a little bit just briefly because um, I, I thought it was a good point that that you had brought up, Tony, which was that, you know, $80,000 per year to house somebody as an inmate versus how much it costs to be like, here's an education, <laughs> here's a way out of this. Uh, and I think even the most fiscal of conservatives, as I've, I've heard people call themselves, would uh, if, if they're a true fiscal conservative, then wouldn't they want to save taxpayer money and, and push that towards potholes or something? And that is one way to do it, which is, it, it sounds like these rehabilitation, if, if they're, are they called education programs, rehabilitation programs, reintegration program because I'm not sure what the proper term is it sounds like that's what they are doing in a lot of ways it's kind of almost a win-win situation for everybody except for the prison system who's losing a ton of funding I'm sure actually they so our prison system prior to COVID was about 180,000 we're at about 90,000 now and their budget actually increased by the billions how did that happen because their budget increases every year. So it just increases no matter how many people are in there? Yep, because um, they have the strongest state union, they have the strongest, you know, kind of, yeah, they they um, they, they have a lot of money. <laughs> they have a lot of money. Okay, so we are going to get into the round robin. Um, this is everybody's time to you have about two and a half three minutes each you can discuss whatever you'd like you can talk about your pets it's your time uh though for our listeners and those viewing on youtube and channel 11 12 uh or who will be viewing over the weekend um just uh perhaps it'd be a good idea to have them take something away with them so it's whatever you'd like them to take away uh let's let's start with the starting lineup that we had earlier and start with Jonathan. Okay, yeah. Um, so I, I'll, I'll spare you talking about my pets. I don't have any anywhere. Um, basically, what I would like to, to say in closing is that these classes that, that we offer are um, not, not placebos. They're, they're not just classes offered for the sake of of being able to say that we're providing something, but rather opportunities for students to engage with higher education who up until now may have not had any opportunities to engage in that way. And instructors like Wendy are um, able to work with these students in, in such a way that, you know, instills that confidence that we were talking about earlier. Um, after that, the crucial step is, is to be able to meet the students when they're released, because in county jails, remember, these are these are people who are in your community. Um, they're going to be in your community regardless of, of, you know, however you treat them, you know, whatever you provide them with. Um, so the next important step is to be able to meet them and um, to make sure that they're connected to other services, because we have so many services on campus, things like DSPS, uh, EOPS, TRIO, and, and oftentimes, you know, students, again, just coming onto campus might not know that all these things are there. Um, so being able to be both inside and outside for students is, you know, not only going to make our community a better place, but also benefit these individuals uh, in such a way that, you know, they will, they will go on to be great assets to our community. And, and like I said, working in this situation, I see this happen constantly. Um, it's, it's really great to begin things like uh, high school equivalency testing with students uh, in the jail and then say like they finish all but one test because there are five tests. So they, you know, we meet up again when they, when they come out and then we do that last test and just to, to see that um, that confidence just in, continue to increase and then to, to go on to either certificate programs or degree programs at the college. And I think that we need to do more to, to continue to bolster that connection because that is 
it remains still kind of a, a rough transition. Um, but I think the, the work that we're doing is is definitely beginning to um, to make sure that that gap is addressed. So in closing, I'll, I'll just say that um, again, these these students are are part of your community, and like let's continue to do all we can to support them. Um, and if if anybody has any questions uh, for for our office, I'm I'm happy to answer them. My phone number here is 707-476-4527. Uh, I'm generally here Monday through Thursday and until 8 a.m. until about 6.30, 7 p.m. Um, and, uh, and we're right downtown Eureka too. So that's pretty more convenient location as well. It's a little more centrally located in the main campus, which a lot of people aren't aware of. So we're at 6th and D. Um, pretty much right over from Broadway by Pinky Pinky Pinky. So feel free to stop by as well. We're always happy to talk about these classes and, and talk about ways that we can continue to in, engage with our community and, and continue to support our community. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Wendy. I, uh, in closing, I'd, I'd like to uh, Say to you the word individual. What I've discovered by speaking with and observing and journeying with my students at the Humboldt County Correctional Facility is they are discovering uh, about themselves and about what they can do. And uh, like I said before, the confidence level is so increased and they are discovering community as well. I have taught a lot of English learners in my time at the correctional facility and uh, they are discovering their own voices and the learning more about, about the different cultures um yeah so the students they just back and forth they're learning about where they came from they're learning about where they want to go they're discussing where they want to go they're educating me i'm journeying with them um it is um a extremely valuable program and i'm very honored to be part of it so thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Tony, you've got about three three minutes, two and a half, three minutes. Um, first of all, I just want to say um I'm just grateful to have this opportunity to be sharing space with y'all. Thank you, Talvi. Um, you know, right what Johnny said, this community, this is like this is community work. And I've been grateful enough to work with Johnny and know the the real like stamp impression he's had. Um, you know by creating educational opportunities um and really you know wendy um you know it, it's it's folks like wendy teachers and and volunteers who go inside these facilities that give us hope make us feel human um and so just really um you know it's um Amazing to see and amazing to share space with you all. Uh, I'm going to steal something from my good friend and colleague, Mark Taylor, who says, um, you know, mass education is a solution to mass incarceration. Um, right. And so, you know, I think that when we talk about education, we're not only talking about, you know, economically, you know, beneficial uh, public safety, right? We were talking about recidivism later, but really on a on a basic, fundamental human level, right? And we're talking about like just basic goodness uh, and treating people with compassion, um, because again, a lot of folks, majority of us that have been incarcerated, have deep, deep seated levels of trauma. Um, and that go back generations uh, or have gone when we were young as youths. 
and you know <clears throat> just never again have been able to just heal or or gone through a path to actually reflect on on these um these experiences that we have and so providing education really um i think is just you know we're really getting to a point where we're saying hey everyone is human everyone inside is our community members and we deserve education and provide this opportunity for everybody so thank you Thank you so much, everyone. Our panel tonight was Jonathan Maiulo, Student Development Advisor for College of the Redwoods Adult and Community Education Program, Wendy Butler, Associate Faculty from College of the Redwoods, as well as a current teacher at the Humboldt County Jail. Wendy also hosts Art Attitude, a program you can hear right here on KZZH 96.7 FM, and Tony Wallensato, Program Director and Co-Founder of Project Rebound at Cal Poly Humboldt. If you are interested in commenting on this show or any other show, or you have topics you want us to discuss, email us at kzzh at accesshumble.net. Reminder, the show replays on Friday evenings at 8 p.m. right here on KZZH 96.7 FM. You can find us on YouTube. Look up Access Humboldt Thursday Night Talk. It should have its, it does have its own playlist. You can listen to hours and hours of this programming and learn all about what's going on in Humboldt County. Thank you to our panel for joining us today. Uh, I always love when it's another super informative show because I was like, I had no idea that any of this was even going on. So thank you all so much for being so informative and uh, patient in your explanations. I appreciate that. Uh, take care everybody listening or watching on, on TV. Also catch us on TV if you have cable, uh, channel 11 and 12 over the weekend. I will see you next week. I'm your host, Talby Free.